Hi, I'm Seth Shostak, and welcome to another episode of Facebook Live here at the SETI Institute. And today we're going to talk about something that you might not think about much, but you really ought to, and that is, what is intelligence? Now, you probably think you've got that nailed, you've been to school, your parents tell you you're intelligent, but what does it really mean? I mean, if you're looking for intelligent beings on another world, do you know what to look for? Do you know how to define intelligence? And is Homo sapiens the only species that's intelligent? You might be biased. Well, we have two people here who have spent a long time studying what intelligence is in other critters here on Earth, but also the question of how it arose and where we might find it. So all the way to my left here is Dr. Lori Marino. Lori is a neuroscientist, which he's also the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. Lori, welcome to Facebook Live here. Thank you here. very much. It's a, always a pleasure to see yes. you. And uh, secondly, we have Lawrence Doyle, who is a principal investigator here at the SETI Institute and uh, truly a renaissance man. He's interested in many, many things, some of which are even academic. So Lawrence, <laughs> thanks for joining us here. Thank you, Seth. I'm gonna start off right at the beginning. Is there not a simple definition of intelligence by saying what humans can do is intelligent? Uh, Laurie, what, what about that? Well, I think that's a pretty circular definition of intelligence. Uh, and what we're always looking for is a definition of intelligence that can be really objective. So I would say intelligence is the ability to take in information from the environment, process it, and then act appropriately upon it. That would be, to me, the most basic form of intelligence. But, but a lot of critters do that. I mean, even microbes do that, don't exactly. they? Exactly. Well, exactly. All, all right, but they don't do well on SAT scores. Now, I know that you have been involved in trying to determine whether, you know, or how intelligent dolphins and other toothed whales might yes. be. Yes. Maybe you could just briefly describe how you you know, what, what you did to, to determine whether they were intelligent. Well, once you get to dolphins, you're already into a very, very highly intelligent group of animals. Uh, but, I mean, I've studied uh, their brains and how their brains are structured and how their brains evolved to look at uh, their ancestor and the kind of brain their ancestor had on land and then how their brain changed over time, over the last 50 million years while they were in the water, to get to be the really brainy beings that they are today. Uh, and uh, but that, that, that's their that's their evolutionary history. That's right. But you actually ran experiments. Uh, I've run some experiments where we've looked at things like can dolphins recognize themselves in mirrors, for instance. And recognizing yourself in a mirror is a, a something that uh, it requires you to have a sense of self so much so that it's it's you can see yourself in the mirror and say, hey, that's me. We do that in the morning, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not so sure I recognize <laughs> myself anymore, but but, but, it's a, but, it's but, but a, can yeah. dogs, for example, dogs don't recognize themselves. Um, do uh, dogs don't, um, and the vast majority of animals don't. That doesn't mean they're not self-aware. It just means that those animals who do pass that test um, seem to have something that uh, that maybe others don't have or in a different degree, to a different degree. So it sounds like there might be sort of a, a spectrum of intelligence. Could that be that? I would, yeah. Most I would animals have some intelligence, but some have more intelligence than others? I mean, perhaps, perhaps. We could talk about different dimensions of intelligence, but sure, there are differences in intelligence across species, within species, and, and everything in between. Lawrence, you've, you've actually got a quantitative way of measuring things like language use and so forth in animals that you wouldn't even think of as being worthy of your study. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the uh, basic idea is called information theory and it's mathematics developed by Bell Labs to apply to telephone lines. How much information are they sending between telephone lines? But our idea was to apply it to dolphins and to humpback whales and to squirrel monkeys and so on to see how much information in bits they're actually transmitting to each other. And it's an objective measure of not just the amount of information they're transmitting, but also it can quantify in units of bits how much information is being transferred. And so our basic idea was to start to apply that. And we began to back out rules of complexity. In other words, in human languages, it's called syntax but I'll just say conditional probabilities between signals. We found those in dolphin uh, communication, whistle communication system. We found that in humpbacks. We found that in squirrel monkeys. So, so 
when the whales whistle, or what, what, what is the correct term there? Like? A whistle. Whistle's oh, good. They okay. do many other, they make other sounds. They make lots of sounds. But I believe it is whistles that you were. Right, we analyze first. Analyzing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I mean, this isn't just them making noise, right, to, to sort of signal to the next whale over, hey, you know, watch out for that, or, or here's some food, or anything like that. There's right. more to it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, uh, basically, um, one example is if you uh, have a copy machine that's low on toner, then when you get back to your desk and you start to fill in the missing letters and words because you don't want to change the toner, <laughs> basic idea there is that you are, because of the conditional probabilities between the words, the frequency of occurrence and so on, you can guess with pretty good accuracy a missing word. And what if two words are missing? Well, you can still guess. What if nine words are missing? You can barely guess. Ten words? You might as well pick a word out of the dictionary because we go up to ninth order conditional probability. And so, in some sense, that has survival value because it means you don't need to hear the whole message. Well, we've discovered that kind of syntax or conditional probabilities or dependencies on signals in humpback whales. How, how, how many noises they, can they go up to? I mean, do they also go up exactly. to? Exactly. We need to get some more data. But if we'd love to see if they exceed the human ability at error recovery by having more rule structure than we do. And that's something we can quantify. So that's at least a pragmatic definition of intelligence. But you need the whole repertoire to do that, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah, when you say that, the whole repertoire, yeah. I mean, that isn't singing and dancing, right? I guess it's singing, that you have to get a, lot, a big data set of the sounds they make. Is that right? Yes. Is depending, that what you meant? Exactly. Yeah, depending on the number of conditional probabilities, the amount of data you need scales as, like, that squared. So in other words, if you want to be able to see if they go up to ninth order entropy, it's easier to do bottlenose dolphins, which have about 50 or 60 phonemes, as opposed to humpback whales, which probably have a few hundred. I see. All right. Now, what other critters have you studied, uh, Lawrence? Because I know that, I mean, dolphins and whales, I think most people would say, yeah, they're probably pretty intelligent. Everybody tells me they're intelligent. They must be intelligent. But you've gone you know, kind of far afield from these well, big yeah. mammals, right? Yeah, the, the most uh, humanly viewed basic uh, organism that I've studied is a cotton plant. A cotton plant? Yeah, a cotton plant that was sending chemical signals out to a wasp in kind of a one-way air traffic control uh, communication mm -hmm. system to tell the wasp which plants to land on for the, for the caterpillar it liked as opposed to the cotton plants infested with worms, which put out different chemicals that attract birds. So here is this little, you know, air traffic control system, and I analyzed it and um, got the vocabulary of the cotton plant, and it can go up to first order entropy. So in other words, the conditional probabilities are not there in its chemical communication but, but, system. But is that real communication? I mean, that's like saying it is a real communication. They're saying this lizard has, you know, yellow spots or something, and you would call that communication. Well, it it caused the wasps to preferentially land on the caterpillar-infested cotton plants, so it's an effect of air traffic control system. It may not be intentional communication. It just may be. I mean, there's in the animal behavior world, there is a distinction yeah. made which should be made or maybe shouldn't be made, I don't know, but there's a distinction made between intentional communication and communication. So communication is when right. there is something to be perceived by another, uh, regardless of whether the animal wants to send a communication signal or not. Intentional communication is where the, the communicator actually is intentionally trying to change uh, the, the mind or the knowledge state of the receiver. So I'm talking to you, that's intentional communication. I know I'm doing it and I know you're hearing it. Whereas um, if you look at my shoes or something, that communicates something, but that's not intentional on my part. And they don't well, talk back. They don't. I mean, that, well, that, that's it's a question. I mean, the cotton plants don't talk. Well, right. Uh, Right. Well, it's intentional. The they, yeah. they definitely have the goal, or the goal of the automatic chemical communication, whatever you want to call it, is to get the, the wasps to land on the cotton plants that had the caterpillars. So there is a purpose. But my point was that you can even use information theory 
to quantify the communication complexity of even plants. Mm -hmm. So right. that was my point of doing so that. Uh, one of the questions that a lot of people have asked me is, if you have some sort of intelligence, and this was mostly in the context of machine intelligence, which we seem to be developing this century, that's a controversial, project, uh, uh, controversial statement with this crowd, but the question is, do you have to be self-aware, do you have to be conscious to be intelligent? And I, I think I asked you that years and years ago. <laughs> like, could you yeah. have a very, very smart machine, one able to write great literature, hold Facebook Live <laughs> conversations, but it's not aware of its own existence? And you said to me, and I quote, never happen. That's it, right. What, that it won't be? That, yeah, you said you have to be self-aware. You have to be self-aware to be intelligent. Um, what I meant is you have to be self-aware to be conscious. You don't have to be self-aware to process information. So I, at this point in time, I believe, and I'll go on record saying that I don't think there will ever be an AI that will be conscious. And that has to do with the fact that when we create AI, we're not creating something that's meant to be self-aware, it's meant to be conscious and have a phenomenology. We're creating a, a very, very complex tool uh, that uh, crunches information for us much faster and in a much richer way than we can. But there's no there there, there's nobody home. And uh, from my study of brains and where emotions and subjective experience and all that stuff comes from in biological organisms, um, unless you've got a brain with the limbic system in it and an evolutionary history, you're just a very, very, very fancy screwdriver. <laughs> you heard it here first. You year. did. You, you did. did. She and just said, now if any of you AI out there, I don't know how many of you are listening. I'd love to talk to you about it. You and know, If you're self-aware, I want you to get in touch with her because she owes you a dinner or something. <laughs> but, but now this, this kind of, since we've talked about the prevalence of intelligence you know, across a wide variety of, uh, of life here on Earth, the, the question to me then is, well, where did it come from? I mean, you can see that it has some survival value once you have it, but I mean, how, how did we become intelligent? Was, was that some sort of miracle? I mean, did something very unusual have to happen? Mm. I think well, that's a Lori question, but I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna add after I, I okay. nothing. Well, I don't think it's a miracle, but I don't have the answer to that question. I don't think anyone does. All I can say is that when you look across a wide range of organisms on this planet, uh, ones with big brains like us, like chimpanzees, like elephants, et cetera, and those that are, have, you know, very small, simple brains like jellyfish or, or even single-celled organisms, there is a continuity there that you can trace uh, um, between or among them. So for instance, all single-celled organisms who are mobile have uh, a membrane that's able to respond to the chemicals in the environment and do that according to the same electrochemical principles that the neurons in our brain use. So there truly is a, a real continuity there in being able to be affected by a change in the environment and that really is what our neurons do. Put them together and you get something like our brain. Well, but maybe I'm being naive here, but you know, when I think of intelligence as it applies to humans, it's the ability to foresee the future, you know, the reason mm -hmm. to invent science, whatever, that kind of thing. And here were the dinosaurs, and you know, there was plenty of continuity between the dinosaurs and everything that came before. Right. Dinosaurs were around for 150 million years, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. They didn't get smart in our sense of the, the word smart. So, I mean, was there some special circumstance in this long line of evolution that uh, led to intelligence in us? Well, that is another question, right? Because you're saying, okay, let's look at human intelligence. What happened there and how did we become who we are today? And that is a, a question that is very difficult to answer. No one will really know the answer to that. We have a lot of stories to tell about it and we can guess and everyone has got their favorite story, yeah. right? But you can't go back in time. You can look at some stories as being more plausible than others. But the point I'm making is that there is no bright line. So you don't get a human brain de novo. 
pop up, right? It comes from something. And then the brain that came before that came from something. And the brain that came before that, and before you know it, you're back, uh, you know, three billion years to single-celled organisms. And, and it's a truly a continuity. So we can't look at the human brain as a miracle or anything other than uh, a variation on a theme that's been around for a very long time. I'm going to ask you then, the, 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 the Lawrence, because, all right, you're saying that there's this continuity. And my question to you is, okay, so I give you uh, a, a, another planet where life got started, no matter how, but it got started, and let it sit there for, well, not four and a half billion years, let it sit there for 10 billion years. Uh, is it very likely that it's going to develop intelligence in the sense of human intelligence? Well, maybe not in the sense of human intelligence, but what if intelligence could be defined as the ability to survive on your own? So we have trees that make their own food and eat it, and so their genetic um, instructions are much more complex than humans. And so the ability to make your own food, we would be lacking in that intelligence. Now, what is our trick? Our trick is tool making. As far as we know, the dinosaurs didn't go to the moon because they didn't deflect the comet. But we've been getting through. Maybe, maybe you should explain that because <laughs> deflecting a comet is not a prerequisite for going to the moon, except that maybe it is. But yeah, it, right. But maybe going to the moon is a prerequisite for deflecting. OK, but the basic idea is we spent the last 100 years overcoming this physiological bias that human bodies are completely different and in no way connected whatsoever with all other critters on Earth. We just magically appear, and we're entirely separate. And DNA and genetics and so on, we've come to face the fact that we're not all that different from the next species. Okay, but we do find ourselves in an age of bias now where our communication system is entirely independent and what none is in no way connected with any other communications, communication system on planet Earth. That's just not true. So I think we're facing that bias now, and we're going to have to get past that. And one way to do that is to get an objective measure like information theory and say, guess who else has complex syntax? Humpback whales, bottlenose dolphins. Do squirrel monkeys? Well, not as much. Do ground squirrels? No. So you can so, come up with a number that's different than just you know the, the, the mass of their brains. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, they're, they're all complementary. All right, now let me just say here, uh, that uh, we have viewers here in various countries around the world, 70% uh, of whom claim to be intelligent. We have uh, Norway, <laughs> Brit British Columbia, Portugal, Greenland. We, we always have somebody from Greenland. I wonder if it's the same person or whether we're getting people all around Greenland. There aren't that many people in Greenland. Bosnia, Herzegovina, <laughs> Melbourne, in Australia, of course, Pakistan, Louisiana, and there are actually some questions. So uh, since my questions don't really Greenland. measure up, I'm going to try some of those. Um, Amal asks, is intelligence part of knowledge or is knowledge part of intelligence? It's a fairly subtle question. Anybody mm. want to take that? Well, um, I've used the term knowledge in papers to distinguish uh, meaning. And information theory measures complexity, but not meaning. Uh, in order, if you know the purpose of the communication system, then you can back out meaning. So one example is uh, an ant who's coming from a food source runs into another ant and they chemically communicate and the ant that's gotten the communication can get within a certain distribution of the food. Well this first ant told the second ant where to go and we can actually put a number on that in bits. The minimum amount of information this ant needs to have received from the other ant in order to get that close to the food. So that's an example of being able to get meaning out of knowing the purpose of the We got a number for that. I mean, how many bits does an ant convey to another ant when it bumps into it head on? Roughly. Are you talking five bits, 500 bits? Oh, no, no. Um, I would say two or three. That's just a guess. Two or three. Ant mm -hmm. people out there, correct me if you can. Uh, <laughs> Entomologists. But, but the choices aren't that big. Uh, we can look at bees. Bees basically dance, and they use a polar coordinate system to communicate, and it's a dance system and they communicate something that isn't there. So that's symbolic communication. And bees can go out and find the honey source. And what's interesting is one guy I read about, a, I think it was a Cornell professor doing an experiment, and he was putting 
the honey source farther and farther out to see what mm -hmm. the resolution of the bee dance could do. And he'd been doing this for a week or so, and his grad student called up and said, my car broke, I didn't move the honey today, and the professor said, never mind, I'll go do it this afternoon. He gets to the honey, and there aren't any bees there. They're waiting for him <laughs> yeah, along the same direction that um, he had been placing the honey, and at the right distance. So the, not only the location, but the, uh, the velocity at which the target moves. Exactly. And extrapolating. And exactly, and they got it right. They were waiting in exactly the right place he was supposed to move the honey to. And that not only shows good counting skills, but it also shows a sense of the future. Mm -hmm. Right? They were going not where the honey was, but where it was supposed to be. So you say, humans can reflect on the future. Well, I, I don't know how the bees found where they were supposed to be, but it involves the future somehow. <laughs> I, I, you know, I've seen posters in subway mm -hmm. stations that say, uh, the memory of goldfish is three seconds. It sounds like a, not true, right? Not true. Okay, well, I feel better about it. I don't know why. <laughs> here's, a, here's a question from Lou. Mm -hmm. If self-awareness uh, is self-awareness the same as sentience? Uh, I just take that and say sentience is the ability to feel things. Self-awareness is the ability to think about yourself as, an, as a being with an autobiography and a, on an ongoing timeline, uh, or to recognize yourself in a photo or a movie or a mirror. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Commonly used self-awareness is not the same as sentience. However, uh, there are a lot of people who feel that all animals are self-aware, uh, but just to a certain degree. And in fact, I would make the argument that self-awareness is really pretty fundamental because you have mm -hmm. to know the difference between where you end and somebody else begins. Mm -hmm. So that's a form of self-awareness. I, I, my, yeah. It seems to me that sentience is often misused to mean yes. intelligence, of course, yeah. so that, that's a semantic problem. So is, is sentience is ow, and, yes. and self-awareness is I hurt I remember myself. remember that definition. I hurt myself, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right, all right. So uh, I still don't get an answer from you here on the question of are we likely to find, and this is really for both of you, are we like to, likely to find intelligence? of the human variety um, on some other worlds. I mean, the, most of the planets out there are much older than the Earth, right? Uh, the, the, the universe has been around for twice, three times the age of the Earth. So most of the stars are, so most of right. the planets are older. So right. they've, you know, on average, they've had more time to cook up something as clever as your neighbors. Have they done it? I mean, obviously you can't answer, but is it likely they've done it? Uh, I think it's likely that, especially if they're detected by a radio receiver that they have developed at least uh, some kind of significant overlap with what we would call our technology. But in detail, um, they wouldn't be human-like, in my opinion. Uh, when you see the little aliens with the five-fold symmetry and big eyes and all that sort of thing, they look an awful lot like primates. I would almost go so far as to say humans were modified over a few million years into these creatures. But, you know, if someone says, I saw a spacecraft land and it looked like a, a cross between an octopus and a redwood tree, and yeah. it came at me like a helicopter, I'm going, okay, that's just weird enough to be possible. <laughs> that, that's true. <laughs> I don't know, Laurie, Laurie told me once on a, on, a, on a trip that we were making to a conference, I showed her a picture of one of these little gray guys, right, with the big eyeballs yeah. and the no hair and all that. And she said, well, you know what that is. So she said, that's a projection of what we think we will evolve to. Mm -hmm. Oh. You know, that's well, humans that's a, good point. Uh, yeah. a million years now, right? Yeah, so yeah. we think if an alien comes from another planet and lands mm. here, they've got to be smarter than us and more technologically sophisticated. So we project out, okay, so what does that mean? Uh, throw us into the future a uh, few million years. We've got giant brains. Uh, giant eyes, all the rest of the stuff, the body and everything is pretty much an afterthought. Um, <laughs> you've, got, you've got a projection of our future. You mentioned bigger brains. I mean, are we likely to develop bigger brains? We, we haven't gone very far in 10,000 years on no. the brain size. And in fact, there is uh, evidence that our brains are actually getting smaller. Really? Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, actually. And when you think about it, um, it, it makes total sense because of the fact that um, we could, could not give birth to children, infants, with a bigger brain than we do now. We're pretty much at the limit. Mm. Right. Um, and there would have to be some pretty fancy shifting around of our biology and physiology and reproductive system uh, or the gestation period in order to to make that go away. Okay, I can imagine that giving birth to, to babies that are going to have a 10 pound brain might be very difficult, <laughs> but the, 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 the fact that our brains are shrinking, yeah. can, can you elaborate a bit on that? I mean, that's I don't know that much about it except that I do know that, you know, when you look at uh, the brains of within our species, and I think it's over the past uh, few hundred years, although I'm not sure, I know that there is some evidence that um, our brains are actually getting smaller. And remember, too, that mm. when you look at Neanderthals, right, um, their That's brains true. were actually larger than ours. Okay. So, you know, brain size has its limits, especially when you're in a body like ours. Uh, brain size has its limits. To what extent is brain size a good index into intelligence, whatever we mean by that. I mean, if you have a bigger brain, are you, are you just smarter? I mean, if that's the case, I guess elephants are pretty smart. Well, it depends upon, oh, uh, yeah, I mean, it <laughs> depends upon, certainly brain size doesn't have any meaning within a species, within human species. Across species, it has a little bit of a meaning because it really does, because what you see is when you look at brain size um, and you compare it with body size, then that seems to be correlated with some doing some fancy stuff, like having the ability to use tools or have fancy communication. And as brains get bigger, they get more differentiated. They just get fancier and more complex. So there is something to it. But with that said, you know we're starting to see animals with tiny brains doing the same stuff that primates do. For instance, insects and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's a true statement, but there's a limit to it. Yeah. So the origins of intelligence, um, we don't know. But uh, Lori points out that there are a lot of what you would call, I guess, just so stories mm -hmm. about, what, I mean, you know, Jeff Miller, I think you're well mm -hmm. familiar with him at the University of New Mexico, says it's, a, in a sense, a consequence of our dating behavior, right, that we, we need some index of, uh, Genetic health and intelligence is one of those. Yeah. So people select uh, smarter people to, to mate with, uh, those sorts of things. But those are all sort of uh, biological mechanisms. I kind of wonder, given that this is the century in which we may develop artificial generalized intelligence, right, which you say will not be self-aware, uh, you stand by that, I mean, you know. I stand by that. Okay. You and I'd love to debate with anyone or even just have a discussion about that issue. I think it's a really important issue and uh, it's one that uh, we need to discuss because I, I just, I don't see it ever happening unless we deliberately build computers uh, that have those capacities. But even then, we are more likely to build a computer that kind of looks like it's self-aware than it being actually self-aware. But there are people who would say, you know, self-awareness is maybe an emergent property, which is sort of a funny, uh, fancy way of saying that, you know, if you build the brain complex enough, that it becomes more and more self-aware. But uh, you're, that you're, to me is a, is a uh, it, it, anything could happen. You, you can call anything an emergent property. Uh, it's then a miracle happens. And, <laughs> and so it just means that, you know, you don't know, uh, you don't have any reason to think it would happen, but poof, there it is. It, so. it could be quantum computers come closer than the usual <laughs> zero one kind of computers to the way humans think. Uh, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll make a prediction too. On this very spot in a million years, a giant computer will step out of a spacecraft and a small computer with him and he'll say, Son, this is the place where the first computer accidentally assembled itself in the primordial silicon. Yeah. So it sounds like day the earth stood still, right? Yeah, exactly. In, in at about a billion to, years. Yeah, yeah, Gord. But it's like uh, we have to understand that we're hu measuring things humanly until very recently. And intelligence may not be just human intelligence. 
You know, it, it's amazing the bias. You, you, I've gone to like SETI meetings and they talk about will they be transmitting pi or the golden ratio or <laughs> something like that. But when I go up to Alaska and I watch a very intelligent bubble netting humpback whale rise to the surface and I just don't feel like we're, pi is what we're going to be discussing. Well, you know, it, but it's intelligent. It's just not humanly intelligent. All right, I'm going to riff on that just for a <laughs> last question because we're, we're, we're kind of out of time here. But, and, it, and it's this. We've done fairly well with our three-pound brains over the past, whatever, 300,000 years, whatever Homo sapiens has been around for. Uh, we've developed uh, the technology to allow Facebook Live. We've developed a few viewers for Facebook Live, <laughs> all that stuff. But what do you think? Is a three-pound brain, I mean, you, you guys don't seem very keen on artificial generalized intelligence. Is a three-pound brain enough to understand, you know, all of physics, what caused the Big Bang, all these really, really big questions, or even to understand itself? Are there any limitations to a three-pound brain? Why wouldn't there be? There's limitations to every system in the universe. So you're saying there are limitations? Yep. <laughs> well, we have to learn to think outside the box. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> to me... Um, yeah, but this, this, is outside, this box is your skull. I, <laughs> but I think intelligence may be... There are rules of intelligence that supersede its expression. In my opinion, it's like the math isn't in the chalk. So when we get to the more basic rules of intelligence, then I think we'll see that um, trying to contain it in different shapes that are like us will have outgrown that. Right. So in other words, I guess what I'm saying is we, aren't we may not necessarily be limited by a brain at all if there are rules of intelligence that supersede it, like the law of gravity supersedes the mass of the Earth. So I'm kind of interested in the more uh, esoteric aspects of what are the rules of consciousness, what are the rules of intelligence. I would like to agree with you, but your argument unfortunately exceeds the capabilities <laughs> of my three pound brain. <laughs> oh, all right, I want to thank our guests, Laurie Marino, Lawrence Doyle, and thank you for watching. And we'll be back next week with another Facebook Live.